We will start the, the second part with a keynote speech given by Matteo Carbone, founder and director of the IoT Insurance Observatory from Italy. I would stop here with introducing him because uh, Matteo is so, it's such a well-known enthusiast and uh, uh, advocate for technology, telematics, internet of things, anything that you can imagine uh, and uh, may help both insurers and insureds to navigate better, more easily in the insurance world. Uh, so I think he really doesn't need any introduction at all. <laughs> you, uh, I'm sure that you know him very well. Matteo, Mike, it's waiting for you here. The remote is there. You can uh, Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Today, I would like to discuss with you the future of auto insurance. And uh, I will start with uh, my key thesis. The future of auto insurance will be telematics based. There is a market, the US, that uh, has already acknowledged this. Today, if you talk with uh, a US insurer, you feel this. You see three quotes on this chart, one from the CEO of Full State, that is saying that telematics is necessary to compete. One from one of the investors in Geico, that is saying we missed an opportunity, we missed the wave, now we are heavily investing to close this gap. And the last one is uh, from the last earning call of Progressive. It was uh, the earning call where they talked about the results of uh, the previous year. It's a pretty relevant earnings call. Well, they said uh, our competitors are losing money. We had, uh, as always, 94% combined ratio, everything is going well. Today we talk about telematics because it's relevant for us. So I let you image how an earning call like this uh, impacted their competitors. Players that denied telematics for years, they feel they have a gap to close. So this happened thanks to the usage of a mobile-based telematics has been a game changer in the US since 2016. Well, Europe has not followed yet this path. So many of your companies have not yet leveraged this opportunity. And to be honest, the history of telematics in Europe has been uh, successful in a couple of markets. Italy, UK, where the average premium is pretty high and uh, allows to add uh, an hardware, an hardware-based telematics. I've always heard from other markets, uh, we would love to explore telematics, but it's too expensive to add uh, this hardware, considering our average premium. Well, with mobile-based, uh, this barrier is removed. So this uh, is a concrete opportunity in any European market. Uh, I will spend the next uh, 15 minutes going through some reasons for using telematics. So uh, I will define this uh, uh, a checklist that any company can use to identify if telematics is something that uh, is necessary for them or not. Uh, before, uh, I would like to share uh, a couple of uh, uh, evidences uh, about uh, what your customers 
are thinking about. Uh, at my think tank, the IoT Insurance Observatory, last year, together with Swiss Re, we did a survey, 10,000 policyholders, comparing uh, what uh, European policyholders uh, think about uh, an app that monitor their driving behavior, maybe provide some services, uh, and we compare the European answers with the US answers, where this kind of approach uh, is already common. Quick answer, your customers are ready. There are no strong differences from the US. Clearly, you can see some markets where the level of resistance as Germany is higher compared with Portugal or Italy, where almost no resistance. But you have at least 45% of policyholders that can be considered a promoter of this kind of solution in any European market. So your customers are ready. The point is, would your company benefit from telematics or is not necessary for your business? This is the real question. So let's start with the first question in the checklist. Are you interested to price more accurately the risks? So the basic of telematics, the way that has been introduced in a market as US 20 years ago, has been with the switch and save focus. So proposing telematics to a new policy holder. Uh, an upfront discount uh, and uh, at the first renewal, data are used to tailor the renewal price. So you monitor it how the driver behave, and then you define a renewal price that is uh, tailored on this uh, behavior. So which kind of uh, benefits uh, insurers obtained with this approach? First of all, self-selection. Who accepted to be monitored? Ceteris paribus is less risky. That means that uh, on the telematics portfolio, you have a lower incidence uh, at each pricing level of the worst risks. But the pricing sophistication at the renewal allow to discount the good drivers, also to retain them more, and to surcharge the bad one at each pricing level. So closing the premium leakage that uh, structurally you have in each pricing cluster. Um, I mentioned one key word <laughs> to extract profitability, surcharge. So this is something that many insurers around the world missed. So they applied the telematics only to provide discount to good drivers. Clearly, this is not contributing to a better profitability. So here you see the evolution of the progressive approach on pricing. Currently, they are surcharging uh, up to 60% uh, the worst risks uh, or providing uh, a relevant discount uh, to the good ones. So this is the way, over the years, they have extracted more and more value. The point is uh, how policyholders uh, react if they are surcharged. Well, progressive shared that uh, even if they are surcharged, they are showing only 16% more churn compared with the average portfolio. And they are saying, we are fine if someone doesn't accept the pricing that for us is adequate to their risk. But many of these policyholders accept it. Large part of them stay. So this is a huge contribution to the profitability of the portfolio. In the survey I mentioned before, we asked to policyholders uh, what they mm, prefer as pricing method. Uh, three evidences uh, we obtained. First of all, there is a, mm, a pretty broad set of preferences. There are uh, uh, different personas that are attracted by different pricing methods. So my belief is that in the future, Insurers will have in their portfolio different telematics-based pricing. 
Uh, second evidence, surcharge in a product that uh, give up the hope to have uh, a discount if you are a good driver is not scaring anyone. 50% of the people that uh, uh, share the positive opinion about this concept that we proposed, an app that track you, choose the, a pricing method where was highlighted that the worst case is that they will be surcharged at the renewal if they are not driving well. Um, there is one third of policyholders that are even open to the dynamic pricing. Probably many of you have uh, seen uh, the pricing of Tesla that in the US uh, they introduced that monthly change uh, the amount that you pay based uh, on how you drove the month before. Well, one third of the policyholder, both uh, on the new generations or in the older generations, uh, are even open to this kind of concept. But let's move uh, to another topic. Uh, pricing uh, clearly is uh, an area where telematics can provide a benefit. But uh, if uh, you are looking to grow the number of policies in your portfolio, well, telematics can provide uh, a good lever. This is the story of uh, Discovery in South Africa. They started in 2011 with uh, the first property and casualty product, Auto, and it was telematics based. In 2017, they had already 4% of market share. In 2021, they have 7% of market share. In 10 years, they have become the fifth property and casualty insurer in South Africa. They are not providing any discount. They are providing the hope to receive up to 50% of cashback on your monthly gas spending. If you are able to design a value proposition so attractive, I'm pretty confident that in any market you can grow. This is another question that uh, you can pose to your colleagues. Are we adjudicating and paying claims? If the answer is yes, probably telematics can help. So there is on the table, if we look at the best practices, up to a benefit, up to 10 points on your loss ratio. There are best practices uh, that I've seen directly, members of uh, my think tank, insurers that have used well telematics over the past years, that have been able to increase uh, the speed of their claim process. Insurers that have been able to have the first notification of loss uh, for 75% of their claims uh, within one hour. And you know how relevant it is uh, to start quickly to address the claim. Insurers that have been able to reduce the incidence of body injuries because they are refusing all the small fraud, the inflated claims, by 18%. So all that kind of benefits are extremely relevant on the technical profitability that you can achieve. Behaviors. Are there behaviors that behaviors of the drivers that are generating the claims? Well, if the answer is yes. Again, telematics has been demonstrated as a, a, an extremely effective tool to modify the behavior. Here you see, uh, I've seen this uh, with uh, uh, different insurers around the world that introduced structured behavioral change programs and succeed in uh, reducing the frequency. However, they were all single examples. So I extracted some anecdotal evidences. But this represented in this chart is the first uh, structured study that uh, in the same moment, on the same portfolio, tried different behavioral change approaches. This has been done by the... Uh, an, the um, highway administration in the US that tried on the, on the progressive portfolio different approaches to convince the people to use less their phone. So it's not focused on all the driving behaviors, speeding, hard braking, and so on, but only on the usage of the phone. Key evidence 
frequent and tangible rewards is the way that uh, influenced the most and reduced almost by 90% the usage of the phone. Today there are uh, a pretty relevant number of insurers around the world that introduced, uh, some even in Europe, that introduced uh, behavioral changes approaches uh, in uh, their portfolio using telematics data. What I'm asking to all the other insurers is, uh, what are you waiting for? Change the behavior of your drivers, reducing the claim frequency in your portfolio. Retention. In some markets, retention is relevant. In others, insurers have a pretty high level of retention is less a priority. If retention is a priority in your company, well, there are pretty robust evidences that the telematics portfolio has a, a higher retention than the traditional portfolios. Here you see year by year the difference between the telematics portfolios and the non-telematics portfolios in Italy, where currently there are around 25% of the personal auto policies that are linked uh, with a black box provided by an insurer. So we are talking about uh, a, a statistically relevant sample to study the difference of retention between the telematics portfolio represented uh, in blue and the non-telematics portfolio represented in red. Let's uh, address uh, the most relevant question in my perspective, because everything uh, I showed uh, before was focused on your new business. So the concept of switch and save that has been the core of the telematics approaches for the past 20 years. That honestly is relevant, is uh, good, but it takes time to impact your PL. So the point is, uh, is relevant in your company to quickly improve uh, the profitability of your current portfolio? The answer is yes. Uh, and uh, in many markets, the level of churn is uh, showing that addressing the current portfolio is something that is uh, fundamental to obtain the telematics benefit. Because if you wait that some customers switch in France, in Germany, it takes years. You, have, uh, you see represented here uh, in the survey we, we did uh, uh, the answers to the question, how long have you been with the current insurer? You see, more than two years represent a uh, large part, uh, even uh, almost all the portfolios in some markets. Uh, UK is uh, an outlier where the churn rate is for 30-40% each year. So in these markets, to address the current portfolio, to obtain an impact, is a must. Uh, how you can use telematics to impact the current portfolio? You can add a telematics SDK inside the app of all your policyholders. A few insurers around the world have already done it. Fidelidade in Portugal, Generali in Germany and Austria, in the earning call last month, Progressive said, since March 2022, all our policyholders will have the telematics SDK inside the app, active, monitoring them and helping us to manage better the claims and to provide them services. This is a game changer because you have not to wait that someone buy the new product that this product, this portfolio, become three, five, 10% of your existing portfolio to have some impact on the profitability. Overnight, you impact all your portfolio, or at least all your policyholders that are using the app. Uh, what are the benefits you can expect? Well, if I look at the best practices, the behavioral change can represent up to three 
percentage point on the combined ratio. Uh, on claims, uh, we know that uh, with an hardware-based approach, you have around the best practices obtained up to 10% percent percentage points. The app uh, will probably perform uh, in a, a little less, uh, let's say, two, two points. Uh, let's be prudent. In some markets, uh, the churn reduction will represent uh, a material value. In other markets, probably, is uh, really small, the impact. You have an increased efficiency, because uh, the best practices uh, uh, that have used already, mobile-based telematics, shared that, uh, that policyholders uh, use less uh, the call center or other uh, ways to interact with the insurer, but they do everything through the app, because they start to become more uh, um, more used to use the app. So, overall, this can represent four or five percentage points of improvement on your combined ratio. It is pretty relevant. Last, revenues, the top line. There are players, no insurers, that are selling and they are growing selling these services for a monthly fee a relevant monthly fee, telematic services. They provide a dangle, someone buy this dangle, and pay them monthly a fee. Uh, in the survey, we asked to the policyholders uh, what are the services they are interested about. You see here the answers we obtained by the policyholders that are uh, positive, the one that uh, we identified as promoter of the app. So here you have a, a list of services, the priorities for your policy holder. You can start from the first and then move along the list to create that services. So uh, we asked also, and we, here you see the answers from Italy, France, Germany, Spain and Portugal, so the markets where Euro is the currency, uh, how much they will pay? Well, 70 they can answer even zero. So we are left uh, uh, an open answer. So only 13% answered, uh, I'm expecting that an insurer can give it for free. 71% answered that they will pay at least five euros a month. Five euros a month mean 60 euro in a year. If you add to the profitability of your uh, portfolio on each policy, 60 euro. In some markets, uh, you are uh, multiplying by two the level of profitability. So let's say that uh, you are uh, convincing 50% uh, of the policy holders to buy these services. You have increased by 50% the profitability of your portfolio. So here you have uh, the, the full list of questions uh, I believe an insurer should uh, look at uh, to decide if telematics is something that uh, is necessary in their business or not. Obviously, some of the questions are rhetoric. The answer is yes. I believe that all the insurers, uh, all the auto insurers, sooner or later, will be telematics based. I believe that it will be normal for an insurer to ask all the policyholders to download their app in order to be insured. It will be normal to use uh, this data to influence the behaviors, to prevent the risks, to use this data to provide a better claim experience as Progressive did, and to avoid fraud, inflated claims, and so on. And last, to use this data also to sell services and to explore additional business opportunities as upselling and cross-selling due to the knowledge that you are extracting about the policy holder. So let's close our discussion with a summary of what uh, I discussed with you this morning. So 
Mobile based telematics is good, good enough, and cheap enough to be applied in any market. Doesn't exist a market, doesn't exist policy holders that are not ready for telematics. Exist telematics programs that are not attractive enough. There are robust fact and figures that support the business case for an insurer. Uh, but I think that in everything I shared with you, there is something that should motivate you more than these three facts. <coughs> that is, uh, a player as progressive, a player that for the past 20 years has always been among the insurers globally with the highest total shareholder return, did it. They spent even all their last earning call talking about this. They are adding the telematics SDK in the app of all their policyholders. So, Progressive did it. You have not. Are you so confident on denying this business opportunity? I would be not. Uh, everything I shared comes from the discussions of my think tank, the IoT Insurance Observatory, that uh, over these years uh, have aggregated in discussing the IoT opportunities, so telematics in auto and IoT in the other business lines, many European and North American insurers, reinsurers and tech players. For any company that would like to know more about to use uh, in a profitable way IoT and telematics data in the insurance sector, feel free to reach me out. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Matteo. Um, just one comment, because here, progressive, uh, I wanted to share that with you. Uh, it's open, publicly available, their, uh, in, uh, their uh, investors conference call on, on 1st of March. And you will find a lot of details in this and, and some, some annexing presentations to see how telematic works for Progressive. Progressive is also making a point, their biggest competitor is Geico, which is a Warren Buffett company. That is doing as little pos uh, parameters as possible. So they're doing the opposite of, uh, of, um, of telematics and they're also successful. So it, it's, it, it's a nice competition. And a second one is for a selection of telematics, also in the US, if it's driver-based most of the policy, then it's more successful than it's vehicle-based. So if you have, I'll give you a state, Pennsylvania, you have the statutory limits very low, $10,000 is a sum insured, huh? so you have to see this not a lot. What you can buy elsewise is something like an accident insurance, and here it is per car, it's on a car base. So telematics doesn't work very well. On other level, Michigan, I think it's 80% telematics because they are very expensive and they have a lot of, of drivers. You find information on that as well, uh, on those things. On these elements, I think that uh, the most relevant uh, difference, state by state, about the penetration are uh, how the commissioner uh, allowed uh, to implement the tariff, more than if it's the car of the, or the I think people. So. <laughs> this is, Talking with commissioners, this is my feeling. Okay. Some California is impossible to use telematics because the commissioner don't want. Yes, he <laughs> says, I will not, I, this is what you have to see, US is not free. Uh, the politicians have a, a word to say. You know, the, the insurers in California put in papers showing that the loss ratio 100%, no, I will not allow you to increase the tariff or change the tariff. So, yes, yes, but I think there's also a little bit of statutory uh, impact. So, telematics, it's, it's just interesting. If you really want to look into it, there's so abundance material free at the moment, where you can also see how much money it is. And also, seeing it from Germany, I just got a new car. Uh, if I went on a telematic tariff, the maximum I could save front end is 40 euro. And then if I drive perfectly, according to that, it's a 30% discount, so another 250 euro. And so it's, it's not a lot compared to, to, the, uh, to the US. And in Germany, the vehicle type is, even, is, is always still more imp uh, important uh, uh, than, than who drives it. Uh, and let's see. Okay, questions from the audience? 
We will have that discussion later on, and then uh, maybe there is some questions then. One, one last word on, 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 on Matteo. I think the first time I listened to you on telematics, that should be 10 years ago, 11 years ago, something like that. Something like that. He didn't change. His opinion has always been very similar. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, he did. Thank you. Uh, he didn't change and his enthusiasm is the same as always. So <laughs> it's uh, good to see somebody with strong opinions and maintaining them. Uh, we will continue with another excursion in the future of motor insurance or, or uh, other way says, said the future of mobility. Uh, hearing from Swiss Re, thanks to Orsolia Hegedush, lead automotive sales and delivery for uh, Swiss Re. Uh, so we will see how not only technology is changing the insurance of the cars that we already know, but how the new style of mobility changes the insurance business that we know. So the change is coming on several paths. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Um, my name is Orshi Hegedish. Again, I've been working for Swiss Re for the past 12 years. And together with our team called Automotive and Mobility Solutions, we are trying to answer questions like, are we as an industry ready for the future of mobility? We are going to hear a lot more in the afternoon about what that future of mobility means, but let me tell you a little bit of what we found um, when we asked ourselves that question. Is this? Oh, working. Um, you might ask what a reinsurance company like Swiss Re does, um, play, what role do we play in the new mobility era? And the answer to that is we try to drive this transition to new and safer mobility as part of our mission uh, to make the world more resilient. In practice, what it means is working together with partners like OEMs, BMW, uh, Luminar, equipment manufacturers, or Matteo himself, as he mentioned, we've done some surveys together uh, on this topic in trying to quantify what these new mobility trends mean from an insurance perspective, from a risk perspective, and help OEMs, mobility providers, and insurers translating that into risk insights so they can design better products for this future. Mobility is changing rapidly. And during our research, I wanted to bring you four insights or four challenges that we have found to be relevant for insurance companies. The first one is that the motor market is growing rapidly. By 2040, we are expecting global motor premiums to rise to double to what they are today. However, it doesn't come without challenges. So this rise of premiums is actually smaller than for some other risk pools. So we see that the mobility risk pool is going to be smaller compared to some others in the future. Um, and this growth is also coming mostly from emerging markets and shifting from personal lines to more commercial lines, which is posing a challenge to insurers. Mobility is also getting more complex. If you think about urbanization, decarbonization, change of demographics, this is make, uh, putting a lot of pressure on existing mobility infrastructures. There's also there's also an abundance of new data sources. So there's new data, Matteo mentioned one, which is telematics, but there's also connected vehicles and a lot of information coming about the cars, um, digital twins of, of infrastructure, etc. So all of this information that is becoming increasingly relevant for insurers to understand when analyzing the risk of mobility. And then last but not least, we have overarching mobility trends, which tend to be more technological. So the future of mobility, in our view, is going to be connected, autonomous, shared, and electric. And some of these changes are already on the roads today. So in the path towards full automation and full electrification of vehicles, we are already on the road. We have cars with lane keeping assists and emergency brake systems on the road. And we as insurers don't know exactly how those are affecting the risk on a vehicle by vehicle basis, although it's becoming very important. So we at Swiss Re believe that it's a decisive moment for insurers to stay relevant in the motor business and they need to understand uh, what this means actually in practice. 
So I wanted to ask the question, what does ready mean for insurers? And we're going to listen to lots of presentations about different aspects of that in the afternoon. You can talk about digitalization, customer engagement, retention, etc. But I would like to provide you a view on what it actually means in the understanding of risks and being able to price those risks. So it's going to be that, um, that angle that I'm going to um, explore. And what we believe it means that insurers need to elevate their existing rating models and be able to have a holistic view of motor risk, which involves the driver, location of the driving, and the vehicle. Matteo already talked about telematics and how that can help us having a better view of the driver itself, of the driving behavior and how that affects the risk and how insurers can use this as a tool to elevate their models. Location of the driving also matters. So the geographical environment of a car, looking at road density or weather, and the interaction between the driver and how they adapt that driving behavioral to, to, the, to a certain location matters as well. And then last but not least, the vehicles itself, it, themselves. They are becoming, as I said, more connected, autonomous, shared, and electric. And this does change the risk landscape. Today I wanted to show you through two examples, focusing mostly on the vehicle, how much this effect actually is already today, and why it is important, extremely important for insurers to start thinking about these and implement them, uh, changes to the rating models today. So I'm going to talk about autonomous and electric driving in a bit more detail. The first example, autonomous, autonomous driving, we're not talking about fully autonomous vehicles, but already today one third of all cars are sold with some kind of advanced driver assistance systems. So think about parking assist, um, emergency braking, lane keeping assists, um, or, or speed control, adaptive cruise control. These are all ADAS features that are in vehicles. By 2030, we are expecting that half of the car park will have some kind of ADAS feature. And what it means is that you have a very complex product architecture with different sensors being built into the car that contribute to different functionalities, and these functionalities are interacting with each other. So it's not only important to look at um, the power of the car or the brand of the car, but it is very important to look at the exact car themselves and understand how these systems are performing and interacting with each other. So when we talk to insurers, some of the challenges that they mentioned, which are the most important ones in understanding these systems, is first, not knowing what ADAS systems are built into their specific vehicles that they are insuring. How effective are these ADAS features in preventing accidents, but also not just preventing accidents. We get that question a lot. It's not just about frequency, but if you have ADAS, is it, gonna be, is, is it going to cost us more to repair that car because of the sensors that are very expensive? And if you have a good ADAS, and that's very expensive, that might be fine. But if you have a bad ADAS system that doesn't perform well, but the repair costs are high, that is you know, then you should charge more um, for the risk itself. And last but not least, again, the triangle of driver, location, and vehicle. How does the driver use ADAS features? Do they switch off certain features that they don't like? And how often do they do that? So in order to answer these questions, what we have done at Swiss Re is we've developed a solution called the Swiss Re ADAS Re Score, which aims to translate technology into actuarial science and bring insights into the presence of specific ADAS features and their engineering performance in preventing accidents. Why is it important and why is it important to do it on a vehicle level? I have brought you one example of one specific car and two different trims. So it means two different specifications of the car. Uh, same brand, same model, same year, but two different trim versions of the same car. What you see here is our ranking. So the first five categories is emergency brake, parking, lane keep, speed control, and light, where we give a rating from zero to four. Zero meaning there's no ADAS present in the car, four meaning highly effective ADAS in preventing accidents. And then there's an additional category called system integration, which we rate from zero to nine, that shows you how well the systems interact. So if you can think of there's a parking assist system, 
but if you if you pair that with an emergency brake system, what you're able to do is not just give a warning that you're too close, but the car stops itself and prevents accidents. So not just relying on the driver interacting, but also making sure that you actively prevent accidents. And that can really help in that system integration scoring. So again, same brand, same model, same year, two different trims. And the difference between the performance is very clear, right? There's a 20-25% difference in the performance of being able to prevent an accident. That is, that is real impact. If you look at not just frequency, but look at the overall picture, what you can see here is anonymized examples of um, portfolio analysis that we've done for some of the clients, both for MTPL, so liability, as well as CASCO, or motor own damage risks. What you see here is ordering the, the cars into four, five different buckets, so uh, most performing ADAS on the left, least performing ADAS on the right. The green line represents existing rating models, so you see that if you um, factor in every underwriting, um, underwriting factor that you use and, and only measure the effect of ADAS, they don't really make a difference, uh, don't, don't take into account any difference in existing models, and they tend to over or underestimate the effect of ADAS. The red line is what you see as the real truth, so that's claims experience. And then the blue line shows you how the average risk premium would look like if a ground model would take into account the ADAS risk score. So what you see here is both for MTPL as well as, well as for MOD, for the highest performing cars, you could get, give a 30% discount on risk premium, but for the lowest performing ones, you need to load them by 25, 30%. That means it's very important, right? This is a huge uh, improvement in the predictive power of your book. So on average, it's fine, right? But it, it does make a difference which vehicle the person you are insuring or the vehicle you're insuring looks like. The second example that I brought is electrification. So electrification is reflected in the product roadmap of most car manufacturers. What you see here is the pledges that some of this brand has made to go either fully electric, be it battery electric vehicle or hybrid or full battery electric, or just making pledges um, and commitments to invest time and money into electrification. I think most well-known brands are on this, on this one, and it doesn't even contain some new brands that are manufacturing only electric vehicles. These cars are also getting on our roads. So um, electric vehicle sales doubled in the past year. In last year, every 10th vehicle that was sold was electric, and by 2030, we um, estimate that every third car will be electric. The biggest driver, is China, so their electrification is really very much on the rise, but we also see it happening in Europe. There's a couple of things that are still preventing the adoption of EVs, so range anxiety remains one of the key concerns. If you ask people, they are afraid that if they have to drive long distances, they will not have the infrastructure, they can't charge their cars, etc. And there are differences across markets also in our region. So what you see here is the color coding is the GDP per capita, and then the percentages is um, sales share um, in terms of percentage of cars sold. And what you see is that obviously affordability, um, being able to pay for these vehicles is one of the main factors, but that's not the only one. Governmental incentives change a picture a lot. So if you compare, for example, Norway to Switzerland, where GDP per capita is similar, in Norway, 86% of cars are, cars are sold are, are electric. In Switzerland, it's only 22%. But you can also compare uh, markets like Portugal, where GDP per capita is very low, 20% adoption rate, with Eastern Europe, where it tends to be a lot lower with similar GDPs per capita. Demo driver demographics also change, so whether it's for corporate use or private use, availability of different models. If you think of the US, Teslas are high-end cars. In Europe, we see a lot of like smaller micro cars that are, are electric. Um, and also the, there's also the, the topic of market readiness. Do we have the infrastructure? Do we have a repair network? Do we have a charging network? Um, the, 
the European recommendation for charging stations is have one charging station for every 10 or less than every 10 electric vehicle and every 60 kilometers have a fast charging station. We're definitely not there yet, right? Most of the charging, about 95% of charging happens still at home overnight. But it is still happening, right? So we will definitely see a bigger mix, a larger share um, of electric vehicles in motor portfolios. The question is, does electrification mean there's a difference in the risk profile? And you probably guessed that my answer is going to be yes, there is a difference. And that uh, the risk of electric vehicles is not captured adequately by internal combust combustion engine vehicles, risk models, like models that are based on um, cars that are not electric. The differences come from the fact that there's a difference in makes and models. So there's a quickly evolving landscape, new cars coming out all the time. The performance parameters that are important are different. So we can think about abrupt acceleration, silence, or the fire risk of the battery. That's very different from, um, from the fire risk of an ICE vehicle. The annual mileage tends to be lower. And then the repair costs are different. There's a re different repair network that, that needs to deal with um, high voltage systems. There tend to be more embedded software, etc. So a risk assessment sailor to ICE does not adequately re reflect the EV risk landscape. And again, I brought you an example of quantifying that. We've built the EV risk score. We are very creative, so ADAS risk score, EV risk score, in choosing the names of our products, uh, which is providing adjustment factors relative to ICE vehicles when it comes to um, risk premiums. So the chart you see here is taking into account MOD, so casco, and liability coverages. And if you have a car that is above the one line, it's an EV car that's above the one line, it means there needs to be a surcharge on top of existing rating models. And if it's below the line of, uh, of one, it means that this vehicle represents less risk compared with all the other things the same. So we're comparing same driver, uh, same um, kind of an ICE equivalent of an EV. So for brands where you have um, the, the car, the same car model driving electric and, and, and ICE, then we use those comparisons. For car brands where there's not, uh, not an ICE uh, equivalent, we are using an, a, a similar ICE vehicle to compare. And what you see here is, for example, if you look at the red bubble on the top right corner, that represents a car brand that produces different vehicles, so different models, and those models are all within that bubble. And it shows that for that specific brand, for example, there should be a 30% increase applied on top of existing models for MOD and around 20% for an MTPR risk because they tend to be uh, riskier. But there's also the other end, right? So you have manufacturers that manufacture EVs that are safer um, than ICE vehicles. These differences show you that the current model of applying a blank discount or a blank um, uh, loading on top of existing risk models is not good enough. We need to be able to move towards this state where we can analyze the, the, the risk of electrification separately. So just through these two, two examples, I'm, I have shown you that there's a 20, 30% uh, improvement in the predictive power of risk models. And I wanted to leave you with a bit of an outlook of how such a holistic risk model can look like in the future. So we believe that the future of motor insurance scoring is going to be dynamic, modular, and vehicle-centric. So what do, I, what do we mean by that? I've shown you that triangle of driver, location, vehicle, but there's a time element to it as well. If we link um, to increasing vehicle connectivity and add a time element, in this example, being able to monitor when certain ADAS systems are switched on and off, we can have a profiling through time of of uh, driving risk of severity and frequency. And what you see here is an example of someone starting to drive with night vision on, but lane keeping assist off, and then switching on those systems, decreasing the riskiness, and then switching off all those systems, increasing the riskiness. So this is the risk profile. We believe that moving towards this dynamic and, um, and holistic view of motor risks helps insurers to better assess risk, helps to, to boost the predictive power and therefore profitability, be able to develop adequate um, pricing to customers, 
bring them value and fairness and help them move towards um, a safer mobility in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm not sure if there's any questions. Well, maybe at first qu audience questions. None? Uh, because one thing I want to thank you. also say, read it. Uh, it's a sigma, what you were referring mm. to. How will the insurance market look in 2040? And compared to many other publications, where well, all the market will grow like crazy or the market will shrink like crazy, it's, it's, let's say, you need to do your job, but there is still a market. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's, it's, the, it's very transparent from the parameters. I like the, the Sigma studies for those future things very much. They're very, let's say, helpful. And if you take an old one, they're pretty, pretty, pretty good in their prediction. Uh, so uh, that's number one. Number two, with the others, what you are, have done, some eight years ago, uh, in the Allianz Centrum for Technik, they did a study on the different helpers. Uh, yes, they were on a lower stage of development, but the basic function was already there. And there, it's still the only one where there was a big field study behind it, and, and, and I, I recommend also that you read that uh, to come in. At the end of the day, uh, the, the key element of success is if there is automatic parking, because a small ditching with a, uh, while parking is the biggest problem because those little claims cost three, four, five thousand euro. Uh, in the past it was 500 euro, now it's 5,000 euro. And uh, that makes it really, really most important that the parking is done by a machine. Yeah. That would do it a lot. Now questions. If not, then I encourage you to read the Sigma. Very good publications. Uh, but I also put that up the QR code, if you can bring back the slide for a second, to download our latest publication on uh, Driver Today, Passenger Next, uh, which is taking into account all the different elements that I didn't have time to talk about today in, in risk assessment. Thank you very much for your attention. And. Uh, uh, thanking uh, Orsolia. Uh, now we are going uh, uh, further ahead uh, again in the changes in the mobility world. And uh, <clears throat> we will uh, use uh, technology ourselves because uh, our next speaker is coming online. Uh, it's uh, Eran Tirer, founder and CEO of Ledger Tech. Uh, it's a very innovative uh, uh, company and uh, uh, Aaron himself is a big fan of mobility and uh, novelties uh, related to mobility and the insurance industry. So I will uh, let him to present himself, his company and uh, what he thinks about bringing innovation in the motor insurance industry and keeping the pace with uh, digitalization and embedded insurance. Aaron, do you... Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Ah, okay. Um, I guess you can hear me. Apologies for not being able uh, to attend in person. I hope the next one I will. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the time to... Uh, uh, talk about uh, mobility insurance, digital motor insurance, and uh, generally how, um, how this uh, uh, market is evolving. Um, Legitech is uh, the low-code, no-code uh, insurtech insure platform for uh, uh, embedded insurance, which is a company I've uh, founded. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we uh, uh, help our customers to uh, actually adopt their uh, uh, insurance products into uh, into mobility and uh, generally what's uh, what's happening in, in this market. Uh, just uh, just a brief introduction. I've been in the insurance uh, industry for uh, about twenty years now. Uh, started with. Uh, a technology company called Easy Source. It was acquired by IBM in 2016, where we uh, did static code analysis products for uh, large enterprise customers. Most of them were banks and insurance companies, and through that we learned the uh, 
challenges that uh, most traditional insurance companies are facing when they have to deal with their core policy admin systems being normally mainframe based and so on. And uh, after uh, spending a couple of years at IBM, I uh, decided to uh, uh, focus on digital insurance and basically help customers to uh, uh, create innovative uh, digital insurance products, which of course led into uh, into the mobility market. Uh, and when I look at uh, uh, the recent, uh, let's say, motor insurance uh, trends and how they're affected by enhanced mobility perception, uh, and I think well, she uh, described it uh, quite well in her presentation, uh, <clears throat> insurance companies are trying different ways to uh, uh, evaluate motor insurance risks, improve underwriting, improve claims using different technology, uh, collecting a lot of data uh, in order to uh, eventually uh, reduce the risk. Uh, this can come from uh, telematics and connected cars uh, data. So evaluate how we drive, where we drive, um, um, how does this, the type of car that we drive, the weather in the area that we drive. Uh, this helps uh, in a way assess the, uh, the risk slightly better, but so not necessarily a lot better. Um, automated damage assessment, especially for underwriting to, to look at the vehicle condition. Uh, and of course, uh, applying more innovative uh, uh, consumption models like on demand, pay as you go, pay how you go, uh, et cetera. Uh, one of the biggest uh, issues of the uh, Motor insurance uh, market, at least in, in recent years, is that it's very competitive, very price competitive, uh, which makes it uh, more difficult to uh, uh, apply these new technologies because customers not necessarily want to do it because if they get a better price without having to share the way they drive, then they would prefer not to do it, which is why telematics is kind of... Uh, uh, put in a bit of a corner for uh, young drivers and uh, uh, fleets because the, the, the normal traditional driver wouldn't just wouldn't have it if he can avoid it. Uh, that's on one hand. On the other hand, um, uh, insurance companies are uh, trying to focus on um, different digital areas of, uh, of mobility and motor insurance. So, uh, embedded insurance is uh, is one trend that we see uh, more and more uh, uh, interest in. Basically, buying insurance when you need it and where you need it. So, enabling uh, uh, companies to sell insurance as uh, uh, an add-on or uh, as a complementary either product or service to the product and services that we sell that they sell. And uh, if you look at motor insurance, what's more natural than buying motor insurance when you buy a new car? Um, so I think the world is kind of starting to shift to this in terms of, of distribution. We'll see more and more of that. Uh, Tesla started, but uh, definitely not gonna be the last one. Uh, areas like micro insurance, where we can buy insurance for, uh, uh, specific uh, occurrences in our life. And I'll give you some examples later. For example, I'm parking my car. I want to insure the belongings I left in it. Before I started to deal with insurance, I hadn't realized that if I leave my laptop in my car, it's uninsured if someone breaks in and steals it. Um, personal mobility insurance, there is a percep enhanced perspe uh, perception of, of mobility uh, to cover our entire journey. Let's say, uh, we live in the suburb, we drive to the train station, uh, we take the train to, uh, to the city, then we either hop on a bus or we rent a scooter or whatever. Uh, we would like to be able to ensure the entire journey 
and not necessarily look at uh, at separate uh, parts of the journey. So uh, not necessarily ensure just the car, but ensure our journey. And there's a trend now uh, among some of our customers that are uh, looking into it. Uh, issues like uh, EV charging and uh, mobility product liability. What happens if I charge my electric car and there's a fire? Who is, who is responsible for that? Was the fire caused because of the battery of my car or because of the charging station? And uh, uh, who's going to cover the damages to the building where it happened or the shopping mall where it happened and so on and so on. So all of these uh, issues uh, are becoming more and more uh, interesting and uh, kind of affect the way we... Uh, uh, we do um, motor and mobility insurance. Uh, now, when we look at uh, the world of mobility, there is more than just uh, driving and more than just driving in my own car. It can be car sharing, it can be uh, uh, renting a scooter, it could be a combination of, uh, of all of this. Uh, as I've just mentioned before, and this requires uh, a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, our ability to uh, uh, create new insurance products. One of the uh, one of the things that our customers are facing is uh, the need to to be able uh, to create insurance products quickly. Uh, and efficiently, and in many cases, it's microinsurance. And when you're looking at the premium of, uh, I don't know, one euro per uh, uh, per insurance case, then you cannot apply the the traditional uh, IT approach because it will take you a lot of time, will cost you a lot of money uh, to come up with uh, with a microinsurance product, which. By the time you add up all the IT, the traditional IT costs, you might not be able to, might not make commercial sense, but your customers still need it. So there's there's need to be a different way, a different approach uh, uh, to uh, to contain the situation. Um, and if we look, if we're looking at uh, the the way the insurance uh, the insurance world is uh, uh, is going, so. We see uh, uh, a lot of interest and a lot of action happening in uh, happening in product automation, in distribution, and uh, embedded insurance is one distribution channel. Uh, there are of course direct sales, there are insurance brokers and agents, and so on. Uh, in terms of consumption models, there is uh, uh, traditional annual policy versus usage base versus on demand. Um, Micro insurance that I mentioned, uh, insurance as a service, uh, etc. And and if we're looking at uh, and this uh, you you mentioned 2040, this this one talks about 2030, which actually is not it's like seven years uh, around the corner. It's not that far. So distribution will definitely be be changed. Um, we see it uh, more and more. You know when I bought my first car insurance. I went to the insurance broker that my father used to uh, uh, insure his car with and they can argue about the price. Uh, but my son, for example, is uh, is doing everything online. He doesn't, he's not interested in speaking to a person. Uh, so distribution will change. We would like to have the insurance when we want it and uh, where we need it. Um, Insurance is a service, so um, not necessarily having a relationship with a traditional insurance company. Um, underwriting uh, will become more and more uh, automated, uh, and uh, we we see that the combination of uh, uh, data and, and technology uh, can help us uh, get there. Simplifying uh, claims, even if it's uh, starting with automated or digital first certification of loss, uh, 
sometimes if you're using telematics and uh, uh, you crash your car, the, uh, the telematics platform can initiate uh, uh, the first notification of loss. And of course, how, how will reinsurance uh, uh, look at all of this and how will they uh, um, integrate uh, all the data into the risk model? And I think that uh, and, uh, what we've heard just now from Swiss Re is, is a good example of uh, how, uh, how the direction that uh, the world is going. Now, presenting the problem is one thing, but let's try and look at, uh, at a possible solution. Um, if we look at, uh, at the way traditional insurance uh, companies are, are working today, they're running uh, uh, 30, 40 years old uh, uh, policy admin system, primarily built on mainframe, some on I-series, mainly in COBOL or uh, uh, AWS Natural or uh, RPG. Um, which means that it would take them nine to 18 months to come up with a new uh, uh, insurance product. I'm talking about traditional insurance product. I'm not talking about uh, something like uh, a unique uh, or advanced in terms of uh, consumption models with some uh, uh, digital uh, uh, process associated. I'm talking about the traditional one. So that's a problem. It's too slow and too expensive. Uh, on the other hand, we have digital insurers that uh, tend to build uh, a specific uh, a specific product or a specific solution for for the type of insurance product they sell digitally uh, which means that they spend tons of money on customer acquisition costs uh, tons of money on a specific uh, uh, insurance product but you'd like to expand or to get into new areas, then it becomes more and more difficult. And we can take uh, uh, Lemonade as an example that started in the uh, uh, home insurance area. And when they wanted to uh, enter uh, uh, motor insurance, they spent uh, half a billion dollars acquiring Metro Mile. It was very good for Metro Mile, but not so sure how good it was for Lemonade. Uh, so uh, what, what we've done at Legitech is actually um, trying to understand what are the problems uh, in this market and how, how we can help solving them. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, we did spend 15 years prior to uh, Legitech in helping uh, large enterprise insurance companies to better understand and better maintain the core uh, policy admin system. So we understand the problem. Uh, so we came up with uh, an easy-to-use, low-code, no-code platform that enables you to define new insurance products in a matter of days or weeks rather than 9 to 18 months. Uh, we focus a lot on embedded insurance uh, and MG as a service, which means we're not actively trying to sell our solution to traditional insurance companies, although we have customers who are traditional insurance companies. Um, the, the consumption models are configurable. So pay as you go, pay how you go, usage based, peer to peer, etc. cetera. Uh, and we've created an ecosystem of uh, technology and uh, uh, data providers on one hand uh, to enhance our uh, uh, core product capabilities and uh, capacity and fronting providers, on the other hand, uh, to combine technology and business. And um, motor insurance is, is a great example because one of the things we did was uh, uh, an integration with a telematic solution provider. We provide a platform. Uh, we do not uh, intend to... Uh, understand well enough and be professional well enough uh, in the telematic space, but there are several uh, players in this uh, market who are. And what we did, we chose one of them and we're probably gonna do it with uh, a couple of more and we integrate them into the Legitech platform. So whoever wants to create uh, a motor insurance product that includes uh, uh, telematics, it's already embedded in the platform. 
including uh, uh, all the business uh, aspects of that. So you don't have to worry about integrating a new platform or a new component uh, into your core policy admin system because it's already on the Legitech platform. Uh, and uh, when we look at the uh, uh, insurtech market as a whole, uh, we see a lot of uh, insurtech companies who are innovating uh, a subset, like a specific insurance product or a subset of an insurance product. And we, we call them like feature companies because they do something very nice, very well, but it's a feature in a product or a sub-product of, of an insurance line. And telematics can be a good example for how you uh, uh, improve a motor insurance product. We have uh, uh, technologies that were embedded into the LegTech platform like vulnerability and threat assessment for uh, cyber insurance or even simple things like uh, uh, Google Maps for parametric uh, crop insurance or passport scanning for travel insurance and so on and so on. And of course, as we work uh, uh, together with our customers, if there is a demand to uh, uh, bring a new product uh, or new uh, uh, technology component uh, into the platform, uh, we will do it. And the same goes for uh, for data sources. If you'd like to improve the way you do uh, uh, pricing or rating, then uh, we have uh, uh, business partners who can provide uh, the relevant data. Uh, the other thing is uh, is to do with uh, uh, capacity and fronting because when I look at uh, uh, at our customers, some of them are traditional insurance companies that definitely don't need our help in that, but a lot are uh, MGAs that uh, are being uh, founded by people that either come from the insurance industry and don't, don't necessarily have the uh, uh, knowledge and capacity from a technology perspective or the technology entrepreneurs that understand technology but don't understand insurance. If you remember the uh, uh, first slide I saw about the, I showed about uh, uh, the management team of Legitech, we do have uh, a senior executive uh, uh, from the uh, insurance industry on our executive team uh, so that we combine our understanding of technology and our understanding of the uh, uh, of the insurance business. So we work together with uh, uh, insurance companies to provide fronting with uh, reinsurers and reinsurance brokers, guys like uh, Aon, Howden, uh, Paul Underwriting, and so on, uh, to provide uh, the right capacity for whatever type of insurance product someone might be interested to create on the Legitech platform. So we can either do everything or just provide technology platform uh, and our customers uh, manage uh, on their own with the uh, uh, capacity and fronting. Now, in order to create uh, um, a new digital insurance product, we have a configuration studio, uh, which is uh, has pretty fine category-based uh, category based, uh, uh, insurance product built into uh, to the platform with reusable components. So you can start and create a new family of products and create something totally from scratch, but we've already done uh, some of the work uh, for our customers. So when you start with, Leg with the Legitech platform, you already have uh, the basic building blocks to do uh, parametric insurance or health insurance, motor insurance, cyber, uh, home insurance and, and so on. Uh, so that would be the product category. Then you would define the uh, product itself. So what kind of uh, insurance product, uh, who is going to provide the uh, uh, fronting and capacity in which territories uh, uh, are you distributing it? Uh, uh, what underwriting rules and business processes is it subject to? And of course, once you've done that, you have the uh, uh, insurance policy itself with the policy definition, the pricing, the rating, coverages, deductibles, exclusions, and so on. And, and this process itself can take uh, uh, a few days to uh, to create uh, the right insurance uh, uh, product. Once you've done that, we have an integrated uh, uh, business process engine that allows you uh, to... Um, 
uh, create the necessary business processes, which are part of the insurance product. Two major ones, of course, are underwriting and claims. And there you can start uh, uh, including uh, different products. For example, uh, some customers might in terms of uh, uh, damages. So you would ask the customer uh, to take some snapshots uh, of the car as a part of the unpacking process. Um, can you hear me or have we the, uh, the internet connection? Yes, we can hear you, but uh, you had a few moments oh. of uh, weak Wi-Fi probably. Ah, okay. Sorry. So... As an example, as part of the underwriting process, you could uh, take snapshots of, of the car and look at uh, existing damages and refer to it as like a pre-existing condition of the car. So in case you do smash your car, then the insurer can come and say, all right, these two dents are, have already been there. Uh, some, insurers some insurers tend to uh, offer a discount if, if you do this process. Uh, I think that the uh, original intention of this technology, and there are probably uh, 10 or 15 companies that, that are doing it in the world, was to uh, uh, to automate uh, damage assessment when you crash your car. But I think this has proven to be more complicated than uh, uh, people have expected. And again, I have some personal experience um, going to InsurTech Insight uh, conference in London a year ago, I smashed my car while parking and I sent a photo to my insurance broker. I said, ah, no worries about it. Three, four thousand francs will sort the car by the time you're back. It turned out to be uh, um, uh, 18,000 Swiss franc damage and took much longer to, to fix it. And these are exactly the kind of problems that automated damage assessment cannot uh, uh, cannot identify just because it's too complicated. Uh, <clears throat> once we've created the, uh, once we've defined the product and created the uh, uh, the business process, uh, we automatically generate uh, uh, user interface, which is white label and native, so native Android, native iOS, and web. Uh, so whether an insurance company would like to include it in their app or uh, it's an embedded insurance solution. It's totally branded by uh, the customer's uh, details and uh, there's no mention of Ledger Tech there. And what I'd like to, uh, to do next is walk you through uh, a few use cases. One of them is motor insurance, so I'll talk, I'll talk briefly about uh, the ones that are not just I assume that uh, some of you have uh, a wider interest than just uh, motor insurance. Uh, but they all talk about uh, embedded insurance and uh, um, how distribution can be enhanced, etc. Uh, so the first one is actually uh, embedded travel insurance. One of our customers is a seller provider who uh, um, selling roaming packages and they realize that uh, when they sell a roaming package, it means that someone is going to travel abroad and he will probably need a, a, a travel insurance. So uh, we've created together with them a um, unique travel insurance product, which is uh, basically pay as you go. So you do the underwriting once, and then you have insurance eligibility for a year. And as soon as you travel with your mobile phone, uh, we know where we are. And based on the coverages that you've selected, uh, you're covered, and then when you come back to your home country, uh, as part of your next mobile phone bill, uh, you'll get uh, uh, the travel insurance uh, bill as well. So you pay only for the days that you've been abroad, and you don't have to uh, uh, to worry about uh, uh, doing a per trip uh, travel insurance like people do. And that can be that approach can be used for uh, for mobility as well. Uh, based on the on the type of uh, devices that you're using, if you are using uh, um, uh, public transport or not, and we uh, uh, we do have uh, a customer that uh, is actually a mobility provider, 
It's not part of the use cases here, but uh, basically based on the data that we collect from uh, this mobility provider, we can offer uh, different types of uh, uh, of uh, micro insurance. So the, the example I gave around uh, uh, insuring your car when, when you're parking uh, comes from there. So as part of the payment for the parking, you can add uh, a small supplement, supplement and then your uh, your belongings in the car uh, are insured and that depends on the type of car where the driver is uh, based uh, where the car is parked uh, patterns that uh, that we analyze uh, in terms of of the car usage where in which areas the driver normally drives where it tends to park the car what well, the risk of someone breaking into the car while the car is there, are the cameras in the area, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and based on that, we build a risk, a risk profile and we uh, either offer or don't offer uh, this uh, supplemental micro-insurance for parking. Uh, the same goes for, uh, for EV charging. We're working now with uh, one of our customers about... Uh, uh, expanding the uh, the EV charging experience and adding uh, uh, insurance uh, uh, for your car while you are uh, while you're charging it, things like uh, small damages or um, uh, damage to the charging station, etc. Uh, the other one is uh, parametric crop insurance, very similar to. Uh, um, uh, financial instrument, which is called uh, BLC, uh, where farmers insure their uh, crop uh, based on uh, certain weather conditions. You know, if the humidity goes above a certain level or uh, um, the soil moisture go below a certain level, et cetera, et cetera, you hit the barrier, uh, you get the compensation, assuming you had a damage. Uh, this can be applied in motor insurance, for example, in uh, uh, for uh, let's say hailstorms, so there are there are areas uh, in the world, in Europe actually, within Switzerland, and there are days where it's better to leave your car in the garage because if you drive it out, you're likely to uh, suffer a damage of uh, three, four thousand Swiss francs, and lose the car for two weeks while there it's being repaired. Uh, another one is the. Um, um, Embedded motor insurance, uh, which is telematic based. Uh, we're working with uh, uh, a car manufacturer to uh, uh, include uh, motor insurance as part of uh, purchasing a new electric uh, vehicle. This is something that will be launched in uh, Latin America uh, in the coming uh, months. And uh, basically, when uh, when customer is uh, is purchasing a new car, uh, they get uh, free motor insurance for two or three weeks. It's not really free, it's uh, okay, including the purchase price. Uh, but what happened during this period is we, we use telematics in order to uh, uh, evaluate uh, the quality of, of the driving. And this, this is an example how you can actually kind of sneak in the uh, uh, the telematics uh, uh, solution to the drivers without getting too much resistance. Because if you tell the driver, if you use telematics, you're going to get uh, a discount, then it's likely to uh, see if you can get the discount without using it. But when you give something for free, most people will take it. And during this time, we build the risk profile uh, of, uh, of the driver based on driving distance, times, locations, weather, uh, usage of brakes, turns, speeds, uh, geolocation, etc. And uh, if the driver is a good driver, of course, we'll give him a, a, a really good offer. And if he's a bad driver, we'll probably politely send him to, to the competition. Uh, so this is just an example uh, of how you could take... Um, let's say, a telematic uh, solution and turn it around and make it uh, uh, more usable uh, to a customer. Uh, so this is us in a nutshell. I think I have two or three more minutes left. 
So if there are any questions, uh, either from uh, participants or online, I'm happy to answer them. So any questions from the audience? Thank you very much. None? Oh, the audience is very quiet today. <laughs> I think I there was I only one question so far. Uh, but I, I would have a, a, a question, especially for motor embedded insurance. I always learned there's two, two catches on the, on the embedded insurance. On one side, um, it has to be a simple product. Otherwise, it's even with modern technology hard to, to catch what it is about, point one. And point two, uh, especially for vehicles, uh, that it has to be transparent what part is on insurance. Uh, as I recall, in most countries of Europe, renting a car, including insurance, without naming what the insurance is costing, is not allowed. It's uh, against consumer protection rights, which means, mm -hmm. which means some of the product, which, the product you mentioned, if you put a price tag on it, or you have to put a price tag on it, it well, the effect is, is a little bit diminished. Uh, then, then, then it's not free, which of course it's not free. And the second one, uh, second one is uh, for embedded insurance. It needs to be transparent because very often the embedded insurance is too profitable. You may uh, recall the um, UK experience with, uh, with uh, 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 insuring uh, your life or, or your job uh, while you have a credit or, uh, or similar things. Mm -hmm. or, or also on extended warranty, when the loss ratio is below 30%, that this is not, yeah. not allowed to say. So how, how do you see, or let's say, do you have an example where there's a classical product changed and then really embedded in motor? Uh, well, the only thing we did, well, two things we're doing in, in motor is, one, this telematics, which, uh, uh, we are doing it in Latin America, where I guess the regulation is uh, more flexible. <laughs> so let's call uh, it different. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we haven't encountered the the need to uh, actually specify how much it costs. And you know what? I'm not sure it can be specified because if you look at the uh, fifty thousand euros car, the the price of insurance is uh, for two weeks is negligible. So you can actually claim it's uh, it's free, and it might be. Um, but the other one is the um, is the micro insurance that uh, is associated with uh, with parking your vehicle, and that uh, again we're not under uh, uh, any regulatory obligation to uh, uh, quantify how much it costs, but we do because it's it's like an add-on. So uh, let's say you park and you pay I don't know, uh, two euros per hour. We offer you to uh, add another 15 cents per hour and insure the, the property in, uh, in your car up to a 10,000 euros limit, uh, which, uh, first of all, there's nothing like that uh, Today, the only thing I've seen is uh, uh, extended uh, motor insurance. If you park your car at the airport, they offer you to get uh, an additional insurance for uh, uh, scratches and uh, small damages. But if you have like if you have a good motor insurance, anyway, it's included. So I didn't understand the uh, the idea behind it. But uh, what what we are offering with the uh, uh, with the micro insurance there. I think uh, uh, is is quite unique and quite uh, required. Actually, uh, I I haven't seen it uh, elsewhere. So that's with motor insurance. If you're looking at uh, if you take the uh, example I gave about travel insurance, this is really um, a good example of how you take a, a traditional product which everybody uses or everybody understands they need to use. And, and you turn it around and by by selling it as embedded insurance, you actually add much more value uh, and actually give a better uh, better financial offer as well to the customer. So uh, I think the world is, is heading towards uh, uh, embedded insurance. And I think that a lot of the products that traditionally people used to uh, buy from insurance brokers or direct from uh, 
uh, insurance companies will become more and more embedded because it's part of our uh, uh, customer experience or purchasing experience. Um, so I think this is the direction we're heading. Thank you very much, Aran. Uh, I'm happy that we've managed to to connect you <laughs> to you. Our participants today. Uh, hopefully next time you will be here in person. For the time being, I'm pleased to announce you that we have one hour to meet in the Bristol Lounge for uh, uh, lunch. And uh, then uh, at about uh, 2.30 in the afternoon, we are expecting you back because we will further talk about novelties in, in technology, but we will also look to the current problems speaking about inflation and the means of uh, dealing with it these days. Bon appétit.